Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on today. A comparison that has been long in the making. If you ask me which two watches do you most want to compare this year, Tim, the answers lay before you. The Rolex Oyster Perpetual Cosmograph Daytona and the new 2021 Zenith Chronomaster Sport. Stainless steel and ceramic chronographs full bracelet versus starts now. Let's talk about these watches individually and then break down their relative advantages, and we'll start with the better known of the two watches, the Daytona. I think it's important before we jump to conclusions that we take a quick look at these watches next to each other side by side so you can really see how the case profiles and the bracelet profiles differ. Note that the Rolex is a little bit more tapered, thinner, finer, and more graceful. The El Primero more volume pointed, somewhat beveled lug profiles and a pivoted end length to the bracelet. The Rolex solid end lengths. You can also see when you place them crystal to crystal, you know, put the pushers on the same side so you can gauge relative to each other just how much thicker the El Primero really is. The Zenith Chronomaster Sport is 13.8, the Rolex is 12.3. Uh, you could see that across the wrist they're really quite similar and we'll go a little bit deeper into that. Let's take a look at the bracelet clasp side by side. You can see the construction externally is very, very similar as is the design of the bracelet. The bracelets are different enough, though similar in architecture and finish. The El Primero does have a little bit of a different kind of assembly and the tolerances between the links are a bit broader. It's when you get to the clasp that it seems like these two really are brothers from another mother. This is where I think the El Primero powered watch most closely parallels the design of the Rolex. Let's take one look from the end of the case so you can see it from this angle and let's do one quick crown profile, crown to crown one more time. This time look at the crown guard structures, screw down crown on the Rolex, screw down chronograph pushers, push down crown and pushers on the El Primero. Now let's take a look at the Rolex, see how it fits, see how it feels, talk about its virtues and get a sense of this watch because it is the defending champion. First launched in 1963 as the Rolex Le Mans, later that year the watch would be remarketed as the Cosmograph Daytona. Years later in 1988 it would gain uniform chronometer certification, a sapphire crystal, and of course, automatic winding. It was in fact powered by the Zenith El Primero from 1988 through 1999. So there was a little bit of a family feud going on here, but the watch is an original in design and style and beautifully sized on my 16 centimeters circumference wrist. 40 millimeters in diameter, 12.3 millimeters thick. From lug tip to lug tip, just the case, we're talking 46.6 millimeters, and then 50.5 millimeters from end link to end link. So that's the actual absolute distance from solid end link to solid end link. Those are features the Zenith doesn't have. The spacing between the lugs on both watches is 20 millimeters. The movement is caliber 4130 inside manufacture, four hertz beat rate, vertical clutch, column wheel, anti-magnetic, shock resistant, master. Well, this is a watch of, that is a master of many virtues. So let's say it is anti-magnetic because of the Neobium zirconium hairspring. It is shock resistant because of the rotor bearing, the free sprung balance, and the full balance bridge. It is water resistant thanks to the screw downs down to 100 meters, and it is a very accurate watch, certified as a chronometer, yes, but then Rolex takes the bare certified COSC movement, puts it in the case, tests it in six positions, and then declares it a superlative chronometer based on timing of no worse than minus two plus two seconds per 24 hours as a fully cased up watch. It's also worth mentioning that this movement has a 72 hour power reserve, which is going to be 12 more than the El Primero, and the vertical clutch system allows for an absolutely seamless engagement of the chronograph. This is something that the Zenith does not have, so if you want to start the chronograph without any jump and run your chronograph continuously, that is a virtue of the Rolex. Both of these watches are loomed. We're going to take a look a little bit later. The Zenith is very similar. Let's get close one more time so you can see them from the dial side. You can see the bezel of the Zenith is broader. It has old style pump pushers. It has a dial with a tritone that we expect on the Zenith El Primero families and the Chronomaster and Revival continuities. So you get that tritone with a little bit of overlap and that's probably the single largest Zenith heritage reference. You cover up those and it really does start looking like a heavily Daytona inspired timepiece. So I think the saving grace of this El Primero is going to be its case profile as well as the movement inside. I think that's what really sets it apart from the Daytona. That's where it becomes its own watch. But basically very similar. 41 millimeters in stainless steel. It also has a ceramic bezel. Not a tachymeter though. It's a chronograph scale. We're going to take a quick look of how it fits on the wrist. I should mention that the watch is very similar lug tip to lug tip if we're just including the case as it is 46.8 millimeters from lug tip to lug tip across the wrist. And while it doesn't have solid end links, the bracelet end links are a little bit rigid. So if you push them in as far as they'll go, the absolute distance across the wrist is 49.7 millimeters. 
and then the spacing between the lugs is also 20 millimeters. Take one last quick look at that case band profile, folks, and then we throw it on my wrist. The watch is immediately evident as a thicker timepiece, though the distance across the wrist is almost identical, and in fact, it is slightly shorter across the wrist. Both of these watches can be worn with a dress cuff, though in a pinch, the Rolex is gonna be thinner and a better match. The timepiece is comfortable, it's nicely weighted, the bracelet feels of high quality, though it doesn't have the structural integrity of the Rolex, and you can see that it probably wears well on a wrist down to 14 centimeters, where I would say the Rolex, you could probably try to get away with it on a 13 centimeter, definitely a 13 and a half centimeter circumference wrist. So that should give you an idea of fit. Taking a quick look at the profile of the bracelet, you can see it's polished on its sides. It does have a little bit of a, and this is why I say the architecture is a bit different. It has a polished silver bevel along the side. You can see that bevel is missing on the oyster bracelet, but you can see that the tolerances of the oyster bracelet are a little bit tighter and the individual links have a curvature to them. Whereas when you look at this watch, you can see that the links have much less of a curvature. The tolerances between the links are much broader and the proportion laterally is just a little bit wider than the flanking links of the oyster. So the architecture is different in ways that matter. But when you get to the clasp, it looks just like the Rolex, but it is not built in any way like the Rolex. When you take a look at the inside of the Rolex clasp, you can see it has the five millimeter easy link quick adjustment system. Then there are those three divots drilled in there. So you can use your strap tool to change the anchoring point of the bracelet inside the clasp. There's also a sophisticated lift lock latching system with a beacon to hook. So it latches once and then it latches again. So that basic lock will keep it shut even if the clamshell is open, double locking for absolute security. So you have three ways to size this. There are the three divots inside, which you can adjust with the strap tool, the easy link, which is the equivalent of adding or removing one sizable link, it's five millimeters, and then you can remove those individual links. Whereas with the Zenith, we have a much less sophisticated system. The clasp snaps shut friction fit, and then you lock it with the clamshell externally. But you can see the gauge of the metal is much thinner, and the system is far more basic. It's a single fold like the Rolex, and internally we do have a few options to restation the bracelet, but take note here the divots, though more numerous, giving you more range of adjustment, they are actually drilled straight through the gauge of the flank of the clasp, so it's a little bit more crude. It's more like a 1990s Rolex Oyster clasp, though I am happy to say that there is a high-quality pin snap system built in so that it will snap shut once you close the clamshell, and it does have a very refined clamshell feel, just not quite as much as the Rolex. Now, the timepieces are easy to tell apart when you flip them to the reverse side. I don't quite have the nails I used to, or the drawbacks of manicures for these videos, uh, but you can see the movement here is visible. It's an El Primero caliber 3600, un unofficially, it is the El Primero 2. And it is still a lateral clutch column wheel chronograph, which means you can see it's big, beautiful structure. Column wheel is used on the Rolex, but it has a vertical clutch, which while more efficient, doesn't give you the beautiful open and revealing profile of a lateral clutch architecture, but it doesn't really matter because the Rolex doesn't have a display case back. So while the Caliber 4130 is fairly well finished for a Rolex, you'll never see it. This movement gives you the ability to see that for which you've paid. And of course, it is an El Primero, which means it has 36,000 vibration per hour beat rate and a very cool striking 10th system. Zenith first introduced this back in 2010. It essentially takes 10 seconds and spreads those 10 seconds around the full circumference of the dial, opening up, for example, the space of two seconds over enormous arc that allows you to more easily discern the one-tenth of a second steps between those whole seconds. Essentially, it takes the sub-register and spreads out the second sub-register over a larger expanse so you can more easily count, for example, five, six, and one-tenth of a second. That's basically how it works right there. So it allows you to count those tenths of a second, whereas previously the El Primero had the capability, the scales were so small you would not be able to read them. And you can see that this system makes it quite easy to read those tenths. Now the timepiece also has something not previously featured on El Primeros, a stop seconds function. It also has a quick set date, notably the El Primero here offering a date. The Rolex also has the stop second feature, but it does not have a calendar, which is probably going to be a matter of contention. Some will prefer the clean look of the Rolex dial. Others will prefer the utility of having a date. Now, what is different is that the hands and the indices on the Zenith are rhodium plated steel. On the Rolex, they are 18 karat white gold, and that deserves to be mentioned. The Rolex also has a tachymeter scale, 
which along with the chronograph allows you to gauge the speed of something that's operating on, for example, a kilometer or a mile. And because it's an 8 beat per second chronograph, you're still going to have to look at those little hash marks in between the second hashes, uh, but it should be a little bit easier to read than if there were five of them. Here you could see that the system makes it much easier to read fractions of a second, and that gives you the ability to fully exploit the El Primero. You will note, however, that due to the striking 10th system, you lose the larger chronograph registers as there is no hours register. The hour register here is not present. The counting stops at 60, whereas here you do have a 30 minute register and then a 12 hour register both. So let's talk about their respective advantages. The advantage of this watch is going to be that it costs a lot less money. They're not priced that differently. The Rolex is 13,150 new. This is 10,000, but pre-owned right now, this is about 10 to 11,000, pretty close to retail. Whereas with the Rolex, you're gonna pay 13,150 if you can get one new. Otherwise, you're probably gonna wait a period between months and years. And if you have to have it right now, it's gonna cost you 37,000 to $40,000 to own this watch pre-owned right now. So advantage Zenith. If you're gonna buy one of these pre-owned, get the Zenith. Display case back, Rolex, no contest. You can see the movement here, and it's a good looking one. I don't even mind the lateral clutch because in this case, the lateral clutch is more interesting to look at than a vertical clutch, which you cannot see. I would also say the cool one tenth of a second chronograph system, whether you're actually using it to gauge tenths of a second or simply impressing your friends with the visual fireworks, it makes the watch feel more special and gives it a unique capability and aesthetic. There is no brand baggage here. With a Rolex, people are gonna case you to rob you, ask uncomfortable questions about your wealth or query you on whether it's real. Whereas with this watch, the only people who are going to notice and comment are real dyed-in-the-wool watch guys who know what a Zenith El Primero is. Now, if you prefer a strap, this watch can be bought for $9,500 on a factory strap. The strap looks great and the watch looks natural on the strap, whereas the Daytona on the best of aftermarket straps can look pretty good, but Rolex did not intend it that way. And most aftermarket straps on the Daytona, if you just remove the bracelet without fitting the strap end link, uh, it's gonna look very slipshod and non-OEM. So this watch is not a natural for a strap if it's not some sort of fitted rubber bee or Everest, whereas this watch has factory straps ready and waiting to go. I would also say the date system, I like it. I enjoy having a calendar. I don't mind this one because it doesn't replace an index. I think it's minimally obtrusive and practical in service. So let's talk about the Rolex advantages here, name and brand recognition. If you want something that communicates your status in life and wealth, and you don't mind being open about that, uh, this is the brass ring right here, no contest. Not important to me as a collector, but I know some people do buy luxury watches for that reason. It's the one to buy new. If you were to buy this watch for $13,150, wear it for three years and sell it, even if the bubble pops a bit, you're at least going to double your money. That's great value. If you can get on the wait list, even if you want to buy the Zenith in the meantime, get on the wait list for the Daytona. It's worth the wait. Vertical clutch, giving it a smoother chronograph engagement, better column wheel feel. It really does have a sharper click than the El Primero, both stop, start, and reset. And then if you want to run your chronograph full-time, a lateral clutch will slowly wear out if you run it full-time, whereas with a vertical clutch, if you just want to have center seconds here, uh, you can effectively do that. Just run the chronograph full-time, no hazard here. I would also say the extra 12 hours of power reserve is a big deal. Now, 60 hours is 10 more than a traditional El Primero, but 72 too, is what you get with the Rolex. What else is important to me? Well, the bracelet. It looks better, it feels better, more solid, built better. You can tell where the money went here. The clasp, there's no content. There's, I should say no contest. The content is everywhere. You have that lift lock system for one engagement, the clamshell lock, the internal gauge of the metal and the gauge of the clasp is, is thicker. There are no drilled through divots. They're inside, but you can't see them outside. And then you have the easy link system. There's less play in it. Any direction you wanna move it, it feels more solid. It is a better bracelet. I would also say warranty here. Five years versus two years standard with one year extension if you register your watch. Three years is not five. Five years is Rolex, advantage Rolex. Both of these watches are rated 100 meters, but only the Rolex has screw down. Uh, two or three years past new manufacture or a service, I have absolute confidence this watch will still be 100 meters water resistant. I don't know if this one will. So at face value, it's the same, but I have a lot more confidence in the screw down. Some more money to 
manufacture, yes, but I think that's money well spent. Also, thinner and dramatically so. Once more, show them crystal to crystal. The Rolex is so much thinner. And while it's true, you get a display case back and a date for your investment in thickness with the Zenith. This is going to make a real difference in how the watch wears with a cuff and how it appears in formal attire, as well as the general expression of elegance from the overall design. Big advantage Rolex. You might be a no-date guy. If you are a no-date guy, you are going to like the Rolex. The dial is much cleaner and better balanced. It's also an original. There's a reason these two watches look almost identical, especially if you cover up the center dials, and it's because the Rolex is just an outstanding design and a trendsetter for the industry. The Zenith, while well, it does have El Primero distinctive elements when you look at it from a three-quarter side perspective, it is very heavily infused with Cosmograph Daytona DNA. And critically, the Rolex came first, launched in 2016 in this variant at Basel World, this watch coming out just this year. A good design, but it was a good design back in 2016 too. As for Loom, it is very close with the Advantage Rolex. And I have to say it is very faint, but you're gonna be able to make your decision. I'm gonna show you at the end of the video. I think the Rolex is just a bit brighter and the Loom patches on the indices as well as the hands are a bit broader. So which one do I want? Cost no object, I'm buying the Rolex. I like the solidity of it. I like the quality of the movement with its longer power reserve, its column wheel feel, the smooth vertical clutch engagement, the toughness engineered into it, the the anti-magnetism and the shock resistance, the full balance bridge and the free spring index, features you don't have on the Zenith. So this is a tougher watch, a thinner watch, a more elegantly crafted and more original watch. It is a better watch to buy new, but if I were buying pre-owned, I would be buying the Zenith. These two watches in watch box inventory, very disparate prices. You're going to pay almost four of these to get one of these. And on that basis, considering the heritage of the El Primero, which is impressive in its own right, the fact that this watch is visually spectacular, and the fact that it wears just as well as the Daytona in 99% of sartorial circumstances, and I would pick the El Primero. So while it's not the most original looking watch, the sum total of what you get, aesthetics, ergonomics, history, and engineering, is in favor of the Zenith Chronomaster Sport. Guys, let me know in the description below which one you prefer. Loom shot. I believe Advantage Rolex on the right in blue.